Hello, welcome to the very first episode of Luca Talk Sports, part of the Sports Talk Line Network. I'm your host, Luca DeAngelis. Um, because this is the first episode, might as well tell you a little bit about what my show will be like in episodes moving forward. So it'll be just any sport is fair game. Whatever I feel like talking about, I'll talk about. Um, my background is predominantly basketball and American football, so they're probably the two sports you'll hear the most about. But my sports fandom stretches far and wide. I love my rugby league, my Australian rules football, even even the beautiful game football, aka soccer. Um, you, you name it. I mean, baseball as well. You name it. I'm probably a fan of it in some ways. Even niche sports like powerlifting and, and Olympic weightlifting. So yeah, it'll be. It'll, it'll be like, you know, like what Forrest Gump says, it'll be like a box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get, except it's likely going to be basketball or American football. Um, I'm excited to bring to you my first guest as well. Um, one of my close friends and co-founder of Sideline Splice, which is a sports blog that started this journey for me, for me and for us. Um, I'd like to introduce to you Ryan Leonard. Ryan, thanks for being my first guest on the show. Yeah, no worries. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, Ryan, um, I mentioned in, the, in your intro that you were a co-founder of Sideline Spice. Um, for the benefit of the audience, do you want to, I guess, tell them how we came up with the idea? And I suppose just share a little bit about your, you know, your sporting background, like how you discovered basketball and other sports oh. you like. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So, like Luca, just an avid sport nut in general. Um, spent most of my day either following, most of my days either watching or following box scores um, or live games of, of really any sport, as Luca said, basketball, American football, soccer, uh, rugby league, and Aussie rules back here. And um, that's sort of how we sort of got to the point of creating Sideline Spice was just we... We, Luca and I recognised over our years of friendship that we spent hours a week talking to each other about sport and, and discussing sport and, and various things and we just sort of thought, wait a minute, why don't, we, why don't we actually try to do something constructive with all of this time that we're spending doing this already um, and, and maybe something can come out of it and luckily for Luca it has and, and he's got to the point where he is now um, and I'm back to mostly just enjoying on the telly and watching Luca's journey. <laughs> yeah, it's too kind, but yeah, you're right. Like it was, yeah, it just was born out of our many, many sports discussions and channeled somewhere creatively. And yeah, now it's um, something I've been doing as a, as a little bit of a side hustle. And in terms of, so you, we're going to be discussing basketball today, just foreshadowing for the viewers. Um, but before we launch into our playoff discussion, how did you become a fan of basketball in the first place, especially in Australia in the 90s where it wasn't that popular? So for me, it was, I was, I was into swimming quite seriously as a kid. And um, we'd always go to, over to each other's houses or while we were traveling away to meets and stuff like that, inevitably someone would have a PlayStation or an Xbox or something, um, PlayStation first, and it was just playing those those sports games like NBA Live 03 back in the day when it was to kill time. In, in the, when we were away at events and stuff like that, we'd all just sort of play play NBA Live, and, and 03 is the first one that sort of jumps out at me. Um, obviously, like most early 90s kids, Space Jam as well has a huge sort of impact on the, the mystery and the hype of basketball, but it, it really sort of got to the point of learning all of the players and all of the teams through through just relentlessly playing NBA Live 03 was the first one that I vividly remember, obviously coinciding with LeBron James coming into the league and all of the hype that that sort of created as well. So yeah, that was that was sort of the major earliest memories of my introduction to, to basketball. And then once you get into one American sport, it, it sort of just cascades from there. Yeah, it's kind of what happened with me. It was more Space Jam rather than the, the video games. It was Space Jam, then the video games grew my love for basketball, and then it kind of cascaded. And fantasy sports was a part of it for me as well. Um, I, I, I was a casual football fan, but fantasy sports took it to that next level, and now I'm the kind of person who gets excited for a draft like it's and gets up at like 5 a.m. every week to watch my Ravens. So, I mean, it's gone full, 
like full fledged. So it's interesting you have a similar origin story to me. Now, early 90s kids, I <laughs> all right, now without further ado, um, so like I mentioned before, this episode is going to focus on the NBA playoffs. Um, it's been, it's been, it's been wild. Um, out at the first post bubble playoffs, but we still have, it still seems like we've got that parity that the bubble had that everyone knew and loved. Um, we're not going to, we don't have ages on the show today, so I'm, I'm not planning for us to go in depth into each series but i think what we might do is we'll touch upon each series um maybe some talking points from them i'd like to hear your thoughts as well um i know you've been following them quite closely i know some series more than others but because there's only so much time in the day but i know you've been across basically all of them so yeah i'd love to hear your thoughts yeah let's let's kick off where you want to start all right, let's start with the first series that has finished, which is Milwaukee and Miami. So it's a 4 0 sweep this year. Um, it's a surprise rivalry series because last year I was convinced the Bucks were going to roll over them. I copped a lot of flack from it in, in some of my groups. I've got a lot of Vocal Heat fan friends and Jimmy Butler fan friends. Um, this year I stuck to my guns. I said Bucks in six. Um, they were better than that. Um, I also caught flack from my Bucks in six this year. They're like, when will you learn, Luca, about the Heat having the Bucks number? They clearly didn't. Um, I know you have a soft spot for the Bucks because your favourite player, Drew Holiday, plays for them. Um, and you're a big Giannis fan as well. Um, I wanted to know what you thought. What was different this time compared to last time? Like, why was the outcome so drastically different just one season later? said you touched on what the main thing was and one of those main things I think is Drew Holiday and what what he adds to the team now we saw glimpses of that through the regular season he's obviously an exceptional player but I think what he brings to both sides of the ball really sort of shows in a playoff sort of setting where it is a bit more grindy you need to slow it down a little bit players are playing longer stretches and he really is a player that He's, he's primarily known for, for his ability on the defensive end um, and that and that defense at the, the guard position or the, the primary wing player that the Bucks hadn't really had previously. But he also brings that, that leadership and that steady hand on the offensive end with that secondary scoring ability. And he, he's really sort of taken the ball out of Giannis's hand as that primary facilitator which has left sort of Giannis free to do what Giannis does best, which is dominate. And um, and I think we're seeing the benefit of having a true point guard and one of the elite sort of true but two-way point guards in the NBA playing alongside a guy like Giannis, who is still learning and still does have a long way to go in sort of his ability to lead a team offensively in terms of getting everyone involved and not just sort of doing what he does, which is crushing it down low. <clears throat> yeah, no, I think you hit the Yeah, sorry, continue. Yeah. And then the other thing is, is just sort of following on from that as well is, is Mike Budenholzer, I think he's probably more aware than, than most that he probably doesn't have too many chances left with this team and, and with Giannis. And he copped up a lot of flack last year for, for the minutes that he played Giannis in particular and their stars and sort of leaving everyone wondering why Giannis was still only playing low 30s minutes in the playoffs and I think this year he's shown that he's not going to he's not going to let that dictate his result and the team's result and his willingness to, to continue to play those guys and say all right you said this is going to be the problem you know this was the problem last year I'm going to take that out of the hands and, and not not leave it out there wondering yeah no I, I agree with everything you said um I think this year kind of exposed that Eric Bledsoe, Bledsoe sorry, wasn't that guy. Um, I don't think people realised how big an upgrade Drew Holiday would be. Um, he hasn't he hasn't been asked to score as much as he was in New Orleans, but he d doesn't need to because he's got Giannis and Middleton as primary and secondary scorers. Um, he's actually fourth in scoring for the series at 15.3 points a game, but he averaged 9.8 assists and 2.3 steals. Um, yeah, completely controlled the point of attack. Freed up Giannis still averaged almost eight assists, but Giannis is better as a secondary playmaker 
at this stage of his career. Like playing a bit more off ball and attacking from the wings really, really stands to benefit Giannis at least until he gets even more confident in that handle and more confident in his decision making. And to your point, um, like Giannis played 36.3 minutes per game that series, um, 36.2 for Holiday, 34.8 for Middleton. The others are more high to, high to mid 20s, but it's those three in particular you really want to play the big minutes in the playoffs. And yeah, it seems like Budenholzer did learn from that. Um, I will touch upon one more thing. I think it's their defense was a big reason why it was a sweep. Uh, Miami was 39% from the field, 33 from three for the series. Um, Jimmy Butler, in, in particular, 29.7 from the field, 26.7 from three. Um, after he played like a top 10 guy, like last playoffs, he, he was a ghost. I, I think Holiday was a primary defender of him. It was like a combo of... Giannis, Holiday. And, Giannis and Holiday were both primary on Butler for the most part. And I mean, even Middleton can probably guard him if needed. But yeah, um, having two elite um, defensive players there on their, their only source of offense really would have... Yeah, I mean, Miami didn't have a chance in, in hindsight, but it's easier to say that in hindsight because they knocked them off last year. But, and yeah. I think uh, that, that probably is an underrated element of it as well. We're spending a lot of time talking about what the Bucks are doing differently, but Miami's not the team they were last year either. No, they, they like, could. Fine. Tyler Hero, I, I don't, haven't found myself thinking or saying a single thing about him all year after we thought what may have been a breakout in the bubble last year, but the heat have been pretty lackluster, you'd have to say. Yeah, Hero was a non-factor. I think him emerging into that second, like, secondary offensive star um, is kind of where the expectations for the Heat um, lay coming into the season. And yeah, he hasn't been that guy. He's, he's regressed from last year. He only averaged just over nine points a game for the series. 31% from the field, 31% from three. Going to need a lot more from Hero. He's only 21, should be fine, but we're going to need a lot more from him if the Heat want to return to the promised land. Um, all right, on to the next series I have. So it's another um, one-sided series. Philadelphia 76 is three. Um, Washington Wizards zero. So I had Philadelphia in six. I thought it would not be because Washington were a threat to take them, but just because I thought Philadelphia might cruise in some of the earlier games. Plus, Washington were one of the hottest teams in the league over the last month or two. I mean, they had to win a ton of games just to even get there. Um... But no, it's it's been as one-sided as most of the regular season um, would have you have believed um, that it would have been. Um, I mean, Bradley Beal's still been great, but he hasn't been shooting well from outside. Only fifteen percent from three, twenty-three percent as a whole for the for Washington as a team. Westbrook um, caught fire for a few months, and his assist numbers are still gaudy: eleven point seven per game. But his shooting splits are forty from the field, twenty-seven from three, seventy-six from free throw. And and they don't. The thing is with the Wizards, they don't really have guys outside of Beal and Westbrook that can step up. Um, Bertans has occasionally caught fire, but he's been dreadful this series. Um, Hashimura is probably a couple of years away from being that guy. Gafford's a really nice piece, but he's more of a lob threat. And I mean, on the yeah, other side, not really. Yeah. No. Counting on him to be a third scorer. No, and yet he's third in the in the um, series for them in scoring. So you know that's trouble. Whereas you know Philadelphia have Embiid, who's a, is, I think he's going to come second in the MVP voting based on some early stuff I've seen. Um, Harris is now there's been reunited with Doc. He's been on a machine again, um, playing incredibly and actually playing up to that contract. And Simmons is averaging almost a triple double. Um, 14, 9.7, 10.7, and 61% from the field. No, he hasn't made a free throw this series, but with Embiid and Harris dominating to the extent that they have, um, it's not that important. And I mean, look at the team shooting splits, 54.5 from the field, 41.9 from three as team. Like, Philadelphia basically doing what they want. So my question to you is, are the Wizards going to win a game? Are they going to maybe get a game four? Um... Yeah, are they going to win games? I mean, technically, they have a chance. They're, they're still playing a basketball game, and, the, and they are in Washington. But, yeah, look, based on what we've seen, probably not. Um, I think what we are seeing here now is 
probably one of the biggest sort of spreads in terms of team talent in, in what was the playoffs. Washington, to me, like, uh, it was a hell of a run to get to the playoffs, but they probably aren't as good as that run would have you believe. Like, if you look at some of the teams that they that they beat, just going back through, through their wins leading up to the playoffs, Hornets, Cavaliers, Pacers, Raptors, Pacers, Cavaliers. Yeah, they had one good win against the Lakers when they didn't have AD or... No, actually, they may have been back then, but... Rusty. But then it goes yeah. back to Cavaliers, Thunder, Warriors, Thunder, Pistons, Pelicans, Kings. Like so, there's like maybe two teams. good teams in that stretch. Yeah, it's it, it's it's pretty dire. Like that's it's not a team that you would have believed. Their record did not paint the whole picture of what that team was, and I think it is just a matter of if if Westbrook is doing Westbrook things and. And Beal's not scoring. What if? What are they doing to win basketball games? Um, and Philadelphia is just, I think, a very good team. Um, <coughs> Simmons, as you said, is back up around fourteen points per game, which is nearly. He'd been around that ten point mark for the lead up in the regular season. That'd be more of sort of a facilitator, and he, and he himself has been a, a big scoring threat and sort of dominating the way that we know he can and Embiid is is Embiid and I think they're, they're to me they look quite good um, I think the changes that they've made with the with the team are really going to help them this year but, but it's going to be difficult coming out of the east but they are a much better team than Washington and I'd say that they're likely to dominate again in game four yeah I think I gave Washington too much credit and I think it's going to be a sweep um, all right so let's move on to Celtics and Nets. So it's two to one to Brooklyn. Um, I, even as a Lakers fan, I had Brooklyn as a title favorites going into the playoffs. I think they broke a record for offensive rating, I believe. Yeah, them in Portland actually broke the Mavericks record that was set last year, but Brooklyn beat Portland out. So yeah, Brooklyn broke the record for um, rating. They hadn't. They, they had what the second best record in the East with Durant. Durant and Harden missed ages, and Irving missed quite a few games during the regular season as well. Um, chemistry was, and it still is, a realistic concern with that team. But I and many others believe that you know their talent is gonna just out just outweigh that. Um, having said that, Game 3 was interesting because Jason Tatum went for 50 points, um, got Boston a win on their home court, 125 to 119. Um, my question for you, I've got two questions actually from the series. Number one is, you know, after seeing what um, Milwaukee and Philadelphia and the Lakers, all, that, all those teams have done, are the Nets still the title favourites in your eyes? And also, based on, I mean, we've seen some magnificent performances from him as of late. So how high do you think Jason Tatum's ceiling is? Jeez. Um, Nets title favourites, in my eyes. We'll start with that one. Um, it's hard once you get to the playoffs and, and recency bias becomes even more of a thing than it is in the regular season. And you start looking at how the Bucks dominated the Heat, for example, and how well they've been playing on both sides of the ball. And you say, that looks like a team that is here to win the playoffs, finally. Um, and then you have a team like Brooklyn, who has all the stars and had been playing well, and then let a pretty lackluster Boston team beat them today, basically behind the performance of one 22-year-old player. Um, with all of their, their three stars there. Um, if Brooklyn had won and they were now up 3-0, and I might be saying a different thing, but that that loss to Boston is, is fresh in my mind. Um, not going to let one performance impact it too much, but I'd say they're definitely still up there in terms of title favourites. It's hard to argue with, with a trio of Irving, Harden and Durant. Yeah. But there's still so much basketball to be played and it's the playoffs and, and anything can happen. And at the end of the day, it's not always the team with the best players that wins. But no. you, you're absolutely right. They're on the 
the balance of sort of how much time they've actually spent playing together, it, it's it is even for players of that caliber, it is difficult to say. Now we need to go and win a championship. Yeah, I mean, it happened to the Clippers last year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's so so it's tough. They, they should definitely still be up there, but the favourites is a, I think there's there's probably three or four teams that be, could be considered pretty much equal favourites at, at this stage. Yeah, um, no, that's fair. Um, oh, before you answer my second question, I will add that. Um, during the regular season, Brooklyn had the 22nd ranked defense. I can't remember the last time that such a poor defensive team um, won a title. It's ha- I know it's happened. I just can't remember um, the time. Like, and the, and the thing is, you know, even the best players will, will miss shots eventually and go cold. My only concern with Brooklyn is, you know, if they do go cold, and they did go a bit more co- not cold, but they went lukewarm last game, is their defense enough to let them win even when they're not hot and that's that's the question i have with brooklyn so yeah anyway um the tatum question so how yeah how high do you think your ceiling is i mean probably as high as anyone's in that that age bracket you'd say um i mean maybe luca might be a bit higher just by sort of the product of, of what he has done so far in terms of leading his team in those big moments. But, I mean, we saw Tatum do that today and he's got three 50-plus point games in the last 15 games. Um, He's stepping up at the right moment. I still do have some concerns about how ISO heavy his his scoring and his offense is. Um, He had seven assists today, um, which was in a 50-point performance, which is actually pretty awesome. But I think you and I in particular both sort of went into this year expecting his assist numbers to be higher than they had been, um, particularly as we expected him to take more of that that sort of offensive usage rate of, of some of the other guys there. Um, I think he does still have a ways to go in terms of getting the rest of his team involved in the offense. But in terms of pure ability, on both ends of the floor, I think his, his ceiling has got to be up there with as high as anyone's. Yeah, I agree. I think he's a future MVP candidate. I guess the one thing holding him back right now is his game-to-game inconsistency. Like, even in this series, game one, 30% from the field, 22 points. Game two, 25% from the field, 9 points. Game three, 53.3% from the field, 50 points. Like, he's... And that's, that's not his first single-digit... Game, scoring game in the last 10 games no he's got well, that's what I mean. like, in that in that hot run he's got a nine he's got a 19 um the 19 on 37 percent he's got a 14 he's got a 15 another 14 but then he's got like a 53 a 60 like a, like a bunch of 30 like a 35 a 38 a few 33s it's yeah he doesn't have that consistency that even luca already has um and you're right to, to your point boston really struggle for playmakers i think that's why they're not going to... I think they're going to be done in five, to be honest. I think that was my pre-series prediction. Good on Boston for getting that game yesterday that I thought they'd get. Um, but yeah, they just don't have that playmaking to that, to generate good looks. Like They're very reliant on ISO, and while Tatum can catch fire, they're missing Jalen Brown, who, you know, another talented ISO player as well. Um, so yeah, they're down, they're down to Tatum and Walker, which is, you know, they're no slouches. It's just... Yeah, compared to Irving, Durant, and Harden, like it's it's like taking a knife to a gunfight. And even though Brooklyn can play ISO heavy, and they often do, but with Harden and Kyrie, um, they're both underrated passers, especially Harden. Um, I think I think was like second in assists this year or something. Um, well, and he had ten assists today in you know, a forty-one point performance, so forty-one, seven, and ten in a loss. Yeah. Like, and, 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 and really, they shot 45 from the field, 42 from three. It's, it, it really was just Tatum sort of carrying the Celtics. You'd think that stats like that and performance like that from Harden would, would win almost every other game. Yeah, and, and I expect it to. I, I expect game four at the, um, at, the, at the Garden to go to Brooklyn and then the gentleman's sweep. Um, I think that's what I predicted before the series anyway. Um. All right, moving on now. So the next series is Atlanta, who are up over the Knicks 2-1. to one. Um, 
there, I, I know it might sound biased when I say this because Atlanta's my favourite Eastern team um, because because of Trey Young um, being my favourite non-Laker player. But, and this is what I've heard from a lot of people, um, for a neutral, this is probably the most fun series there is in, in the playoffs from a neutral perspective. Um, both teams are incredibly evenly matched. I predicted Atlanta in seven before the series. So far, it looks like my predictions on track. Um, aforementioned Trey Young has, in his first playoff series, he's been incredible. Um, 40, 49% from the field, 44 from three, 28 and 10. Um, and yeah, more importantly, he's actually embraced the villain role that Madison Square Garden has given him. Um, so my two questions to you for this one, um, one is on Trey Young, it's actually, do you reckon Madison Square Garden making him the villain has actually made him play better? You know, do you think he has that type of personality where he feeds off that energy? And my second one is Knicks related. Um, what's wrong with Julius Randle so far? Um, he's been, you know, incredible in the regular season. He won most improved, he deserved most improved. Um, but through three games, he's shooting 24% from the field. 30% from three um, for just under 15 points per game, which is well under his season averages. So, yeah, my two questions to you are those. Um, what are your thoughts, Ryan? I think Trey Young, I think he's one of those guys, like Curry, that we've seen for ages, those, those small guys that have sort of got into the league based on, on the back of their, their skill and their shooting ability and stuff like that that sort of, I think they must have that, that chip on their shoulder that says they shouldn't really be in the position that they are based on their physical attributes. And I think he's one of those guys that is on a particular mission to prove that all of the comments about his physique and how he looks and how he plays don't represent his abilities as a basketball player. That is to say that I think he is one of those guys that is fueled by this type of response and reaction by the fans, like like Curry, like he likes silencing them, and he likes letting the way that he plays do the talking. Um, I, unlike you, there's still a lot of things about Trey's game that I don't like, but it is awesome to see a kid of that age step up the way that he has and sort of almost grow in front of your eyes in terms of his ability to lead and to to carry this team um, in this series, I think, I think he's doing he's doing very well, and it's awesome. Um, and I think yes, to say that the reaction that he got from the Madison Square Garden probably does have a lot to do with that. Yeah, no, he's um, it's awesome to see that draft class in general with Doncic and um, Aiton as well as Trey, like all you know young either their first or second playoff series all stepping up and being awesome i think i think all three teams would be happy with who they ended up with and yeah i think you make a really good point i think due to trey's stature he's been in like curry he's been an underdog his whole career he wasn't one of those guys that was anointed from like age 10. so he's had that chip i think um which works really well with a scrappy city like atlanta um he's had that chip his whole time so i think madison square garden probably shouldn't boo him as much because he's just, I think he's used that as fuel since he was young. So, no, very good point there. Um, and yeah, what what are your thoughts on Julius Randle's struggles? I mean, it seems reductive to put it down to something as simple as this, but but as you said, he's he's not making his shots, and that is first and foremost. And I'll and I'll admit, this is probably the series that I've I've seen this with the Utah Memphis series is probably the series that I've seen the least of. Um, so I can't comment too much on the specifics, but you may not be able to tell me more about who his primary defender is. But I simply, like, outside of the shooting percentages, his performances haven't been bad. Even with those shooting percentages, he's still averaging about 15 points a game, 12 rebounds. His assist numbers are down, um, I think probably because he's trying to shoot himself out of this slump that he's found himself in. Um, but, and to say what you always say, at some point there has to be some regression to, to the mean and the question is going to be, is that going to happen before it's too late and they're out of this series? Um, 
we can't say, but I think he has just found himself in a particularly bad slump of shooting form at a particularly bad time. Yeah, I'd attribute some of it to slumping, some of it to Quinn Capella's room protection, averaging three blocks a game. Um, and yeah, I do expect some positive regression. My only flip side is, same for John Collins, he's averaged less than nine points a game, and you're talking about a guy who wanted a max contract in the off-season. So I think, yeah, that, I mean... That, I think it's that's less surprising, though, when you think about the Knicks, who were one of the best defensive teams in the league. Oh, they were incredible. You expect, to have, you, you expect to have some of that negative impact on the offense, but you wouldn't have gone into this saying that Atlanta's going to clamp down no. Julius Randle, for example. No, Atlanta um, was middle of the road. you may have had some expectation of that from the Knicks on Atlanta. Yeah, no, that's right. Atlanta were middle of the road defense, whereas Knicks were fourth in defensive rating this year. So that's a good point. Um, and just one bonus, this, this, this doesn't require any in-depth discussion, but how awesome is it seeing Derrick Rose dominate again? Oh, like, so good. Like, it's, it's one of those, he genuinely seems like one of the better guys to have on a team in the NBA in 2021. Yeah, and the fact that, you know, Thibodeau's finally pushed into the starting lineup where he belongs. I was averaging almost 25 points a game. It's like Chicago Derrick Rose has returned. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I thought he was doomed to, I, I suppose, be, be a bench player who occasionally chips in and occasionally has a big game after all those injuries. But he's playing like a superstar. So really, really awesome as a basketball fan to see that. Yep. All right. So we're moving over to the West now. Um We'll start with the series you've seen the least of, probably. So the um, the first seeded Utah Jazz are up two one against the Memphis Grizzlies. Um, all the games have been reasonably close. I mean, game two was pretty comfortable with the Jazz, but today's game, um, despite the ten point win, Memphis actually were leading with four and a half minutes left. And game one, Memphis actually stole from the Jazz. Um, from in Utah, they won by three. Um, I think it's been a coming-of-age series for Ja Morant, um, averaging almost 34 points per game and six assists, um, 51% from the field. He's doing that even while struggling from three at only 26.7%. Um, Dylan Brooks has been awesome as well. Um, but the, the Jazz are just so, so deep. Um, they've got five guys averaging 15 or more points per game, um, and that's not even factoring in, you know, Joe Ingles, who was... People talked about being a potential six, a smoky for six man of the year. Hasn't really got involved I think in. He was second. So yeah, he, okay, yeah, he was Sorry. second in the end to his to, to Clarkson. So number the number two six man hasn't even done much yet. Neither have Royce O'Neal. So I guess my two two of my main talking points from this series thus far. Uh, you know, how impressed are you with Ja Morant? First of all, I know it's a bit of a rhetorical question, but because I know he's been impressive, but uh, to, to what extent? <laughs> like, did you expect this? Um, and my second one is, you know, are we sleeping on Utah as potential title contenders? I know even I rattled off, you know, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, Brooklyn, Lakers before. Utah often don't get mentioned with those teams. So are they being slept on as um, potential championship contenders? I mean, first and foremost, yeah, Ja Morantz, he's been doing some stuff. He looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the biggest thing is, it's exactly as you said. I don't think we expected this out of him. Um, I think when he was drafted and after last year and rookie of the year and all that, we sort of expected that this is the potential that he could have. But then he sort of had that injury, came back, and he, he hadn't really been looking like he was ready to show us this in what's now been how many games straight of these types of performances? Five odd. Um, like if you look at so the playoffs, just looking at the last, at the playoff game. So you've got 28, 47, 26, 35, 20. But then before that, so before the playoffs and before this sort of explosion, we've got 16, 12. You've got two other 12s in there, 8, 8, 10. Like, it's, it's sort of, I think it's, something's happened and he's just flipped a switch and he's decided that he's, going to show us that he can dominate again and he is doing so and he's doing it against a very good team um, it's it's awesome and I think it's you see it when when the polls come up on the blogs and stuff like that saying now 
at, at different points in the year where you see that comparison between Morant and Zion and you're like, which one would you rather? And it was Zion and then it was Morant and then everyone Morant was into then it was Zion again and now it's Morant again and it's just, it's just going to be this sort of forever battle until one of them really starts to establish themselves at a consistent level where the team is sort of achieving consistent results as well. But Moran has been been awesome and it's been awesome to watch. And I know you mentioned that his, his three-point percentages for this series haven't been um, that great, but I, I did watch the, the Memphis Golden State game where he went five of ten and and even the last two games against Utah have been two of seven, which I mean, they're not. Then that's not great. But he's still hitting those two shots, and I think that is that next step for Morant is is being able to hit those those knockdown, those three point opportunities that he is getting, um, particularly on 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 kickouts and stuff like that, where where defenders are slow to close on him to protect against the drive. Um, but if he shows that he can be a threat or is at least willing to attempt to be a threat on those threes, that is what really opens up his interior game, which is his bread and butter. And I think that's what we are seeing is that he's, he's able to be so much more aggressive at, at getting to the basket and getting into the lane and showing us those floaters and his ridiculous athleticism because defenders are, having, are realizing that maybe they do have to start closing out on this guy. And I think as that increases and increases we'll see this much more consistently yeah no i agree um his three ball just the threat of the three ball does set up his drives um he doesn't shoot too many bad threes which i like um and yeah that's that next part of his the evolution of his game that'll come um and yeah on, on the jazz side of things mike conley has been incredible since returning from injury um he's i think i think this season he had like career best numbers um which is amazing at age 33, very Steph Curry-esque. Um, it's a bit of a revenge series for him because um, the reason he was traded in the first place was so that the Grizzlies could draft Morant. So, you know, there's probably something a little bit personal in there for him. And he's, you know, gone for 23, 5 and 11 and he's hit half his threes on over four a game. And, you know, the Jazz are just so balanced. You've got Mitchell, who's a great scorer. I mean, you've got Conley, who's an awesome secondary scorer, and Bogdanovich. You've got Gobert, who... You know, he's not a shot creator, but he's one of the best, if not the best, lob finisher in basketball. And he's averaging 3.7 blocks, 14 boards. Clarkson won six man of the year. Ingles was number two in six man of the year. Royce O'Neal's a great glue guy. I mean, I don't think that they're their number one player, which would, you know, Mitchell or Gobert, depending on what you argue is more important. I don't think it's quite on the same level as, you know, number ones on your Lakers or your 76ers or your Bucks. But I think like one to seven, they might be the deepest team in the league. So, you know, assuming, I think that they'll get past Memphis in six. Um, I think I picked either five or six before the series, maybe six. I think it was, yeah, I think it was six. Um, no, it was five if Mitchell played the whole series and six without. Um, so yeah, my question to you is how far do you think Utah can go? Well, I mean, I'll answer your question with a question about Utah as title contenders. You talk about the depth of this team, but what was the last team that you can think of that didn't have that clear star guy and was just a balanced, deep team that won it all? Mm, I mean, I, I mean, Detroit's always the easy default answer. Um, Probably the Spurs, right? In, yeah, the Spurs one. yeah, the year when Kawhi... They had Kawhi that was no. establishing so. He wasn't. He wasn't a star at that point. That was pretty balanced. That was the year that Danny Green probably should have won Finals MVP. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's not common, no. But I would argue that you know Mitchell still can take over games like a like a tier one star, and and you know like his duel with Jamal Murray last last year's playoffs. He was playing like a superstar. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's fair as well. I mean, I I don't see it. Um, just because I think we're getting to that point where it's like, can you consider Utah title contenders? Would you have them at the same level as the Nets? Would oh. you have them at the same level as the Bucks or the Lakers? Probably not. Like it's, it's, it's hard to sort of say like, are they title contenders? Yeah, they're contending, and like they might be there at the end of the day, but. If you look at it on the balance of probabilities now, I don't think they're as good as some of the other teams there, despite what their record is. 
Yeah, I mean, they are the only team to have finished in the top four um, for both offensive and defensive rating this year. So their balance kind of even extends to um, just extends to both sides of the ball. So it's just, yeah, it's just a matter of whether balance can beat some of these top heavy behemoths um, that have been built around the league. All right, so next up, so Lakers Suns, this is a series that both of us have watched a lot of. Um, you, because I think the Lakers are just polarizing for neutrals, me being a Lakers fan. Um, the Lakers are currently up 2-1. Um, I predicted Lakers in six before the series. I believe you predicted Phoenix in six. Um, Phoenix are a tough out and they're a good team, but Chris Paul looked like, see, it looked like a nothing injury when it happened, but based on how he's performed since that injury, I don't think it's a nothing injury. I think that there's something going on um, more than there is. Now, having said that, I do think, you know, I think a lot of players are playing hurt. Like, I know Luke has been getting his um, shoulder, like, kept warm. LeBron still looks about a step slow um, since coming back from his ankle. But I think, I think like, for example, in Luke's and LeBron's cases, um, it's, it's minor enough that they're still able to play, you know, 80 Oh, Luke is probably like close to 95% capacity and LeBron's probably still playing at 80% capacity whereas Chris Paul looks hamstrung um, yeah. so I think I said it I said it to you the other, oh, sorry you, you finish your question first and then we'll get into it <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll, I'll guess I was going to say if Paul's actually as hurt as he looks is, is his series going to be done in five like does the Suns have any chance of um, winning <laughs> um, yeah I mean they've got a chance um, it keeps coming back to that. They're still there. They're still going to turn up and they're still going to play. Um, I think they'll probably get another game at least. Um, I said it to you during the last game is like CP3 was still, he was still scoring. He was still getting those little mid range pull ups and, and they were still falling. But it, it, it jumped out to me and it was sort of abundantly obvious to me. I think he lost, he had like three steals of his handles, like not even on lost balls, just sort of like because he wasn't turning quickly enough or he wasn't, his handle wasn't as tight as I'm, I'm so accustomed to, to Chris Paul's handle being. Like I can't even remember the last game where I'd seen him clean, had his pocket picked in a game, let alone multiple times in one game by like players like Dennis Schroeder of all people. Um, so I think that was the point for me where I was like, there's something's off with him. Um, but I think CP3 is what he contributes to this team transcends what he does on the court when he's out there playing. And I mean, I know you're not his biggest fan, but Cameron Payne, I think, has been doing quite a good job. And I think he is quite good at, at getting into the Laker defense um, and, and creating some of those opportunities. I think the biggest issue for Phoenix is I think they're getting a bit shocked by the situation. Um, and they're finding themselves trying to, whenever the, you'll no, you notice it, like whenever the, the Lakers get a few baskets or in a row or go ahead, the, the, the Suns, I think, are just trying to answer by settling the jump shots or trying to get those points back quickly instead of, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a immature playoff team mindset to have is that the points have to come back straight away. And I think that's why you are seeing the lower percentages from the Suns and the settling for the jump shots and stuff like that. Um, whereas they, they're still, even when they are doing that, you're still seeing them dominate when they go through eight and then they really do make him a priority and a focal point of the offense because everyone, he, he's, he's got such weight down low that everything else just comes off of that. Um, and I think they need to go back to, to prioritizing that focus. Yeah. yeah. Even if just to, to to really put the pressure on AD to tie him out so he can't keep dominating down low on offense. Yeah, Aiton's the one mismatch at the Suns really, really... I mean, obviously Booker's a tough cover for anyone, but Aiton's like the one true physical mismatch um, that the Suns have, and they need to take more advantage of him because, um, yeah, I agree. that The Suns have been settling for jump shots after the Lakers' game one loss. Um, Davis in particular decided, nope, not going to settle as much anymore. I'm going to be aggressive and force the issue. He's got to the line a lot, um, which has helped even when his shot's not falling. And I think the scariest thing about the Lakers is that they're such a good defensive team that 
they don't they they can just perform average to below average on offense and that's enough for a win. Like 44 27, like 44 from the field and 27 from 3. Like most teams would be down 2-1 or 3-0 with that. But the Lakers are so good defensively, you know, the number one rated defense in the regular season that then they're up 2-1 just by shooting at like league average. And I think the Suns are playing into that a little bit. But the Lakers are yeah. also um for, forcing that a lot as well. Um and I guess my, my final question on the series is, do you think the Lakers are going to come out of the West based on what you've seen so far? I think they've got the highest ceiling of the teams that I've seen so far. Like, if, I think if they, still, if they put it together, I think they're probably still the best team in the NBA. And I think the road to the finals still does go through LA. Um, I think the like the question is going to be: Can a team put something together for long enough to steal a series from them? I think they could lose a series and still be the better team. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think they are still the best team there, and, and I don't think I've seen enough from any of the other teams in the West to say that I think they should be favoured over the Lakers. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, you know, it, it can always change series to series, but so far, yeah. I, like I always say to you. I expect the shooting to positively regress, and when it does, um, it's going to be very, very, very hard to stop. Um, all right, so moving on to what I think is the most balanced series in the West, um, and and the standings would would reflect that. The Nuggets um, and the Port- Denver Nuggets and the Portland Trailblazers are locked up at two games apiece. Before the series, I had the Nuggets winning in seven. Um, I don't think. It would be that balance if both teams are fully healthy because Jamal Murray last last year um, was probably the player of the playoffs. Um, he was downright ridiculous and not having his offense hurts Denver a lot. But more importantly, his offense, I mean, he's not an elite defender, but his offense forces Damian Lillard to work hard at that end or, Mc, or CJ McCollum, whoever's on him. And that impacts Portland's offense a lot. So that's a big loss. Um, Will Barton not being there is a big loss. He's a very valuable um, starter for the team. But, yeah, so that's even the playing field a lot. And it's made the series really hard to to pick. Um, Lillard and Jokic have both been mostly dominant for the series. Um, they, they both had quiet games today, but their series numbers are still really, really strong. Um, Jokic 31-11 and 3 on 54-45-90 shooting splits. Yep, that's a future MVP. Um, Lillard's also been very impressive, 30, almost 31 for nine and a half. Shooting splits aren't quite as impressive, but still good, 41, 40, 93. Yeah, very, very balanced series. So my question's a really simple one. Who do you think wins and why? I think the edge still goes to Denver. They, they, they've got home court back. They've got the MVP. I think it's uh, use the advantage that you've got and, and take this one in seven. Um, I think the worrying thing is that, and it's sort of the opposite to Morant, is, is in the, at the back end of the regular season leading up to the playoffs, we were sort of seeing what MP, like Michael Porter Jr. was capable of. And we thought, is this the next guy that could sort of reach somewhere near that KD level of offensive eliteness at six foot ten you know what I mean and we're sort of seeing him flip back and and not be the guy that he had been in the regular season in the playoffs and um, and I think that's hurting the nuggets a lot um, you said you see in your in the stats of Jokic the three assists a game that stares out yeah. really glaringly it's like how is a guy that averaged nearly 10 a game from the centre position all of a sudden down to three? And the simple answer is because, one, yes, the Blazers are doing a good job of, of focusing on not letting that beat them. But to get the assist, someone needs to finish. Someone else needs to be there scoring. Um, otherwise, it's just a pass. Um, and and they're not, they don't have that. I think the series is going to come down to, outside of Jokic and Willard, who's going to be the next best guy in the series? Is it going to be CJ? If it is, the Blazers are probably going to win the series. Is it going to be MPJ? 
the Nuggets will probably win, or, or vice versa. Who is it going to be? Who is it going to go? Who is the guy that at the end of this series we're going to look back and we're going to say this player was the player outside of Yogi Pitch and, and Lillard that was the best player in that series? And I think we'll find that that team is the team that then won. And it, it seemed quite simple to put it into those terms, but like outside of Yogi and Lillard, who have both independently been awesome. Um, everyone else has kind of been a bit eh, like Norman Powell led the late Blazers to their win today with like 29 points 20 it's how often are you going to see that happen not not particularly often who is going to be the next sort of consistent person to contribute in a meaningful way outside of those two guys the thing is Norman Powell is a very good offensive player he just played a bit of a lesser role since the trade I actually think like despite my prediction I think the Blazers have more firepower at the moment but the reason I've made that prediction in the first place was I think Jokic is so good that it, it doesn't matter but having said that Porter does need to step up I mean 15 points a game is not terrible but 47 33 87 like shooting splits again they're okay not terrible but he needs to be more aggressive because McCollum and Powell have both been um better contributors and that's why I think Portland's been a slightly better team that, um, thus far this series. So, yeah, Jokic needs help. Um, but, yeah, really, really tough series to pick. Um, and personally, I hope Denver win because I've got a, I've got a bet with a friend um, where the loser donates to a charity of the winner's choice. Um, always happy to donate to charity, but a charity is going to get donated to either way. I'd rather have bragging rights. So, <laughs> go Nuggets, I guess. Um, I mean, yeah, they've got Jokic. Go out and finish the job. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, finally, the last series that we haven't touched upon yet, we've got one of our favourites actually because it's a repeat from last year. A lot of bad blood between the teams. The fifth seeded Dallas Mavericks currently have a two to one um, series lead over the number four seed Los Angeles Clippers. Um, the, I thought the Mavericks were going to go up three nil when they were up nineteen points in the first quarter um, at home, but the Clippers. Brought that brought that back. Um, Kawhi played incredible. Um, Pandemic P disappeared, and Paul George was in there in his stead, and he also played incredible. Um, I mean, Doncic played incredible as he always does, but I think that was the first game where I guess his role players got a little bit exposed for not being not quite being on the same level as like the Clippers supporting cast. So, my. I really want the Mavericks to win because I'm not. I just don't like the Clippers. Um, my fear is that the Mavericks have been shooting unsustainably hot. Um, Fifty percent from the field's good. Fifty percent from three across three games is ridiculous. Pretty. It's not bad. <laughs> no, I mean you've got. I'm, I'm looking at the. I'm looking at the numbers now. You have four guys shooting above forty-five percent on good volume too, like. The seventh best three-point shooter for the series for them is Kristaps Porzingis at 38.5%. So, yeah, I, I think they're going to come back down to earth in that regard. Having said that, um, Kawhi Leonard is you know 34 points a game on 60% from the field and 45 from three. I think that I think that's going to regress a little bit as well. So, I guess, um, do do you think that the Mavericks are going to be overrun by the Clippers? after giving up that game three that they had. And, and I guess secondly, Kristaps Porzingis, he's, he, he was awesome last time the two teams played before his ejection. He was awesome in the regular season. He had a good game too, but for the series, 14.3 points per game, 3.7 rebounds at 7 foot 3 is woeful. Um, and the shoot, 43 from the field, 38.5 from 3. Like the shooting splits aren't awful, but it shows to me a lack of aggressiveness. So I guess, yeah, two questions. Will the Mavericks be able to hold on um, and close this series out? And how can Dallas get Paul Zingas involved more in Game 4 and beyond? Uh, it's tough. I mean, you expect to see some of those shooting splits from the Mavericks decrease, but it, this series is so interesting, not just for the but for, for what's on the court, but the, the mental elements of this game. It's like you put it to, do you expect... The, the Mavericks to win two of the last four games, including one of which, which is still at home for them, or do you, 
are you backing the Clippers to win three of the last four, including having to go back home for for two games? Is it? Is it? So they've got um, yeah. So it goes. So there's one more game in Dallas, and then it goes one, one, one. So yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Including having to, to hopefully go back to LA where they've already lost two after losing the series to this team last year, and expect them to close out. It's 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 interesting. There's some serious mental elements to this game that go far beyond what's what's happening on the basketball court and. The Clippers may just not be able to overcome it. They probably should because I think they're a much better team, and I think they're much they're much better on the court. But there's just that element there that just makes it so interesting. Um, I probably think that the Mavericks still come out, maybe, but it's, it's tough, it's isn't so it? So hard. It's so hard to say. Um, but I think it is going to come down to Porzingis, to be honest. Luke is going to keep doing what he's doing. You're going to have to say Kawhi is going to keep doing what Kawhi is doing. Is that, so the big two questions are going to be, similar to Denver Portland, is those secondary guys, is Porzingis, who's going to be, who's going to end up having had the better series out of Porzingis and Paul George? Paul George easily so far has been quite awesome. Um, but we know how he can get go with these shooting slumps at times and we know also know what Pazingas can do in this exact series in terms of dominating so if Dallas is where they are now with how Pazingas has been playing if he can get himself more involved does that get them over the edge and I, I think it does um, as for how they do that I think you, you phrased the question wrong uh, you said how can Dallas get Pazingas more involved I think Pazingas needs to start thinking about how he can get himself more involved. Um, it, it, you said it yourself, 3.7 rebounds per game from a 7 foot 3 guy without really a dominant interior centre that is understandably gobbling up all those rebounds. Like he, he should be the primary guy. And if the shot's not there, or the shot's not falling, he needs to find a way to contribute in other ways. And is that being a threat on the rebounds um, like it probably should be? He played like 35 odd minutes yesterday and had four rebounds. Um, surely at that height, even standing somewhere near the rim, you can get more than four rebounds in a game in that many minutes. Um, so I think that's the thing. I think he needs to be more of a presence and to start being more aggressive and playing inside. Is he settling for too many outside shots? If I know it, if we know anything about Pazingas, the answer's probably yes. And um, he needs to be more aggressive and be the player that we know he can be, that we've seen be in this series. Yeah. Um, the, one, the one thing I disagree with is, unlike Denver Portland, I think it's very likely that Paul George is going to be the second best player in this series unless he turns into pandemic P. But I think that Dallas have, the, the next four best players all belong to Dallas, right? So if Hardaway is almost as, or Porzingis is almost as good as George, and then the other the other role players play out of their minds, I think the gap in ability from three to six is enough that even if George plays well, the, the Mavericks can hold on. I just, they need to be able to hit inside shots. I mean, yeah, they need to hit, be able to hit inside shots, I guess, as consistently as they're hitting outside. The fact that their two point and three point percentages are equal is it's it, it, it's interesting and and um, their free throws as well. I think their free throws are only like sixty percent for this series. 66. Yeah, I think that's the other thing is is Luca going to be able to hit more than half of his free throw attempts? Forty eight point one percent on the series, not not good enough, especially if it's a close game that it's going to foul him on purpose. Um, for the record, before the series, I had Clippers in six. Um, it's, I think it's more likely to go seven now because it's hard to see the Clippers winning three straight. But um, yeah, it's 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 a, it's a very good series. Um, a lot of underlying um, stories you can't see um, that like sorry that go beyond the numbers, beyond what you can see. Um, and go Mavericks! Like I'd love to see Luke, more of Luka Doncic just as a neutral um, in the playoffs because he's been a joy to watch. Now, I was going to ask you a bonus question, but we've 
gone way over the time that I'd planned. <laughs> so we're going to wrap things up shortly. Um, I know you're not as active um, with your writing anymore and your socials, but just in case people want to see what you've done in the past, um, where can they find you? Uh, just sidelinespice.com primarily. Everything will be on there. Um, yeah, not really on the socials like you are these days, but <laughs> everything that I've done, it, there hasn't been a lot of it for a while, but it'll be on there. Nice. And if someone wanted to ask you a question or follow up, um, your Twitter as well? Yeah, so it's Sideline Spice RL or Rye. Rye. I, I think it's Rye, yeah. Sideline yeah. Spice Rye. Um, because yeah, I know you're a Twitter lurker for news, even if you're not as engaged anymore. <laughs> but um, I'm sure if someone watches this video and they've got questions to ask, I'm sure you'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, absolutely. And I almost forgot to tell you where to find me. So busy pumping Ryan's social media that I haven't, um, I didn't even share my own at the end. So if you want to find me on socials, it's Sideline Spice LD. If my, my handle might be subject to change, but that's what it is right now. Um, you can find me and my work on yeah, Sideline Spice as well. I've done stuff for Lake Show Life, Sports Talk Line, Sideline Sources. Um, I do have a link tree with a link to most of these. I think it should be in my Twitter bio so you don't have to memorize them. And feel free to reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions or comments on this video. Or, you know, alternatively, leave a comment in YouTube and I'll do my best to get back to it. All right, thanks for coming today, Ryan, and hopefully have you again on the show soon. Cheers.